Think. Act. <laughs> and prosper. You are now tuned into the Money Level Show. Hey, Daryl. How's it going? Thanks for having me on your show. Yeah, just here at the New Orleans Investment Conference and, you know, meeting a lot of new people, a lot of uh, faces that I have not heard of in the fin in the uh, financial media space. Um, it seems like there's there's a lot of titans and you just never know who's walking around. Yeah, I mean, it sounds like you've got uh, some you made some really good connections, maybe some interesting guests in the future. Yes, so, yes. Yes, for sure. It's it's kind of interesting, you know, when, when you're at these events, you know, it's like someone could be walking around, you've never heard of them. And then, you know, uh, someone that's that has heard of them has to like, let you know, like, hey, that's such and such right there. And then you have to go look them up. And you're like, Oh, dang, this this is like a an important big figure. <laughs> in, in the yeah, space. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it, it, it's it's really cool. Because you know, going to these conferences, the um, the attraction, you know, isn't just necessarily just the mining companies or the energy companies or what have you, you know, you're you're mining for connections. Yeah, right? yeah, exactly. And uh, there's there's plenty of diamonds, um, mm -hmm. enough, so to speak there. Yeah, yeah. So um, just speaking of, you know, just networking, gathering content, I've been seeing your um, channel for a while. We've been following each other on Twitter. So wanted to have you have you on the show, uh, you know, just show like these these small channels coming together, unifying, you know, and everything. Um but you provide some really great content. Um, I mean, especially, you know, around uh, the commodities and, and you bring on some really interesting guests and some great guests who have uh, awesome insights and trading and such. And so uh, I just kind of want to get some more of your backstory of, of how, you know, what, what in intrigued you to join this space and how did you specifically come to uh, the commodities thesis? Yeah. Yeah. Um, one, one, one thing though, small channels for now you know yeah, once yeah. once the That's once true. the big money the retail money moves into this commodities and energy space all that traffic is going to come you know to to on they're our side find, they're going to find tons of videos definitely like, yeah these guys been <laughs> yeah. yep yep you got to plant the seed um mm -hmm. so what got me into uh you know this kind of space uh, i opened my channel about a year ago um just out of you know i've, I've been studying this stuff for about a few years now, um, really got into commodity investing, resource investing uh, during the COVID crash of 2020. Um, you know, just much like everyone else, uh, felt kind of behooved to look for opportunities at that time. And, uh, you know, just kind of when I discovered the likes of, you know, George Gammon, um, Lynn Alden, um, Chris McIntosh, Rick Rule. Um, you know, all the folks that we listen to, um, you know, in, in, in this space. And, you know, I really got fascinated with the commodity thesis just because it was, in a way it was predictable, but also very volatile at the same time. Predictable in the sense that, um, you know, you can kind of, it's cyclical. Um, it's, it's, all, it's all based on supply and demand. Um, whereas tech, technology, you know, it, it's it's a lot more complicated to price, you know, to the price growth in a, in, a, in a tech stock and what have you. Um, but with with these commodity companies, um, there's a little bit more predictability in that sense. But there's also volatility that comes with, um, although you might have an upward or downward trend, the path to get there is really rocky and violent, right? So you've got to have, one thing I learned is that you've got to have the conviction. Um, to be a commodities investor because you need that conviction to be able to stomach, you know, drawdowns in terms of 30, 40, 50 percent. Um, you know, and that's what we saw in places like uranium, for example, um, over the co course of two years. Um, you really, you know, going all the way up, you track like the URNM um, ETF, you know, this thing went all the way up, indexed from 100 um, all the way down to like 50. So like I think I had like a 50 percent drawdown. Mm -hmm. uh, from the tippy top of 2021 all the way down to earlier earlier this year where it seems like we bought them where we, that's where we kind of bottomed out um and now we're kind of making the 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 comeback up and uh you know we'll look at some charts i don't know when you want if you want to look at them now or or later in the interview um but you know i think what really drew me to commodities is um 
you know, it, it's it was also it, it was also contrarian play. Um, I'm naturally a contrarian person, and uh, I just don't feel comfortable in the herd. I always, you know, uh, I don't like following the crowd. It's just in my nature. Um, mm-hmm. So the commodity, the, the commodities play. When I when I first discovered it, it made it made sense. Um, this was a play determined on the basis of uh, investments that were crucial to the development and sustainability of human civilization. So, for example, um, you know, it's, it's like the the cliche quote that we often hear, you know, from Rick Roll and so forth is, you know, with the uranium thesis, for example, either. Um, I, either I believe it's um, I should know that either the lights go out or um, the price, price has to go up. Yeah, yeah. 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 So it, it it really posed a um, a very clear cut proposition. Um, with a lot of these plays, we don't have the the society that we live in today, um, and emerging economies as well um, want to industrialize. You have Africa, you know, Asian countries. All wanting to, you know, be able to climb, you know, climb up the ladder of, of industrialization the same way that we have, and um, you know, a lot of these initiatives and campaigns about renewable energy and um, you know, like adopting green energy uh, based technologies like solar and wind. Um, while that might sound um, palatable um, for us here in the West. Uh, we live very comfortable lives. Um, you know, the, some of the people in the global South and, and, and you know, in the developing world, um, they don't have that luxury. Um, they've got to, you know, it's it's either you've got to be able to industrialize using the likes of hydrocarbons and, 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 and uh, you know, the way we have um, or face, you know, really death uh, for, you know, by and large, to put it bluntly. Um, so it, it really, the commodity play really made sense to me, um, just because it's a contrarian play. Um, and the, the supply demand dynamics is very easy to understand for a lot of these. Um, and then like the fact that every like, for example, oil was under invested for over the course of a decade. And that's what makes it such a savory um, investment, for example. And a lot of these commodities are the same way. They're all cyclical, right? You know, you need, they they rely on these big booms and busts, these huge spikes up to offset all the years in the bear market where they were just, you know, just scrambling for cash, diluting their investors um, and so forth. So, yeah, 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 there's definitely I mean, the math adds up, you know, and it, it's it's really uh, that's the way I see it, you know, in terms of uh, commodities. You know, obviously, uh, you know, we had the pandemic, you know, that was that was, you know, I mean, we had like even when Cameco had Cigar Lake and I think it was Cigar Lake or McCartney, one of them was shut. I think they, I don't know if they were both shut down or what, but, you know, you had these uh, supply chain disruptions. You had, uh, you know, the um, there was there was a lot of there's just a lot of things that were happening. Uh, and disrupting, you know, the supply chains and with the trade. And then then you add in the geopolitical uh, conflict, you know, of, you know, uh, Russia, Ukraine. And, um, you know, then you got the BRICS forming. Now you have Israel, Hamas, like, you know, it's it just adds fuel to the fire. And it's like every almost everything just keeps adding fuel to the fire. I mean, and, and even at this point, I mean, we can even look at the, you know, the Federal Reserve and and say, how long is interest rates going to stay higher? How long are they going to stay tight um, coming into an election, you know, where, you know, deficits are, you know, ballooning uh, entitlements are ballooning. They're wanting to, to keep raising them. They're not going to cut them, especially going into an election year. They're not going to do anything that's unfavorable. Um, and so, and then you still have this underinvestment in uh, energy and you still have, you know, um, I mean, even these these policy decisions that that impact uh, commodities, and so I don't know. It's, it just it seems like everything just points to a, a higher um, higher commodity prices, um, and I, I just I just think it it probably could get worse, you know, in terms of um, the um, the macro environment, and which is going to be more bullish for commodities down the line. 
Yeah, I mean, you're essentially taking it on both ends, right? The, the demand side and the supply side. Um, you know, because the demand side is coming from you know all these BRICS emerging countries that we talked about wanting to industrialize. I mean, even you you know look at BRICS. Um, you know, China might have a comparable GDP to the to the United States, but the next country down, I think, is like Russia or India. I mean, Russia's got a GDP of two trillion dollars, and the United States is sitting at thirty trillion. Um, so there's really you know. When you look on the BRICS side, there's so much um, eagerness to to want to you know reach the same levels that we have in the West, and you know they're going to make it happen. So you've got that from the demand side, and then you've got the supply side that you've alluded to. You know, really um, kind of kicked off by COVID. Um, you know, where you had all these shutdowns, and that's really where you started to see all the supply disruptions. And that's kind of like you know when you when you kind of like first open a wound, the wound might not kill you, but over time, if left untreated, um, you'll develop infections, it'll begin to fester and all this kind of stuff. And that's kind of like the way I see um, things have kind of precipitated with the with the commodity space um, and the energy space, um, because COVID really was that first opening of the gash. And then you've, you know, you've also got all of these geopolitical tensions. And if you ask yourself, you know, are things more likely to get better or worse from here? Um, I think, you know, pro in my opinion, I think probability wise, I think they're going to get worse. You know, we're in a, a, a fourth turning cycle, which is a revolutionary cycle and not a revolutionary cycle, but a, a cycle where we see a shift um, in terms of monetary system and in, in, in the global order. And these things can be very messy. Mm -hmm. So, you know, in, in messy in terms of wars and geopolitical conflicts and all of these things are inflationary. There's not a single war out there that led to deflation. And so, you know, when, when you, it, when you invest in these commodities, that's really what you're investing in. It, it's kind of depressing to think about, but you know, all things being equal, you know, with the entire world falling apart around you, you know, I'd much rather get rich than, you know, be poor than, than yeah. everyone else. Cause at least if you get, you know, you make, you make, you make, you know, your money, you, you get your flesh and meat, you can help those around you. Um, mm -hmm. you know, so. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Well, uh, uh, I made you the host, so let's, let's look at some charts, uh, and kind of just, just talk through, uh, some of the, uh, the bullish cases for some of the commodities, uh, we're going to talk about today. Yeah. So let's kick things off with uranium. Um, that's the hot topic nowadays. Uh, uranium at 74.45 at the time of this recording. And uh, you can clearly see, I mean, this thing has a rocket strapped, you know, up its, you know what, and mm -hmm. it, it hasn't, it has, it, it, it's looked back. I, I will give it that. It did look back in September, but now it's kind of resumed its takeoff. But you're really starting to see, you know, highs not you know, high is not seen since 2011. I mean, this was the pre Fukushima high of February 11th, and uh, we were sitting at 73.25, 73 some odd cents there. Uh, we broke through that resistance level, um, and that's important because resistance levels are just markers of human psychology. Uh, and, you know, all of these charts are just markers of human psychology because, you know, you've got to think of it that way. You had a lot of bag holders at this point. Who have waited all of these years, 12 years, to finally see price, the uranium price at this level. Um, you know, and there's this is kind of their chance to offload some of this uh some of their your ura uranium holdings. Um, although in the case of uranium, it's it doesn't really trade as in the same way that a stock does. Um, but purely from like a, a technical analysis point of view, that's how we you know we kind of look at it. Um, but nonetheless, I mean making our moves from the very bottom here when we were sitting at $18 back in 2016, all the way up until today. I mean, this is a 4X move, a 313% move. But nonetheless, even if we, you know, zoom out, you know, the high was all the way back here at $140. Now, one thing that I always like to look at when it comes to these commodities is, especially over a long period of time, is to make sure to control for uh, the amount of dollars in, in circulation. So, you know, in this case, I'm going to take the ratio of the uranium spot price divided by the M2 money supply. And I'm going to add this obscenely huge coefficient 
next to it because the M2 money supply is such a huge denominator. You'll essentially get the ratio will essentially just become like a super small denominator. You can't really tell. But anyways, this is a sense. This essentially is how the chart looks now when you control for the amount of money in the system. There's a lot more money in the system today than there was in, say, 2008. And wow. to kind of look back at it from that point of view, um, to control for the money supply, you know, you'd have to see just about a 5x of the uranium price from today. So that's like, that's 70 times five, um, three over $350, um, just about. Um, I know there's some talk in, on, on Twitter. I believe, I can't believe, I can't remember who the um, the analyst was um, that said this, but um, he said that it would not shock him to see uranium um, exceed $300 a pound. Um, that's not to say that'd be a sustainable move, but it'd be something like, you know, a huge, you know, a huge shoot up and then a you know a correction, so to speak. So, I mean, there's a lot of, uh, I still think there's a lot of juice in this uranium price, despite having moved up quite a bit already. Um, especially when you look at this thing, I mean, forget about the M2 money supply. You, you look at uranium priced in, you know, let's say gold. Um, price in something that's real, not just you know fiat money um, that could just be printed. You know, even that. I mean, you're you're getting the same kind of view of things, right? I mean, that's off. You know, despite our growth, I mean, we're still off. Like, again, about five x mm -hmm. over over five x actually. So, you know, this is this is what these ratios tell us because it tells us not only the price of things, it also tells us the value of things compared to what compared to something else. And so uh, the, the the uranium spot price looks good, um, you know, from a long term macro view, and you can clearly see here, you know, you know, moving we were we've been pretty much range bound to this channel here. Um, you know, we could go up here and, and test it, test this uh, this resistance line, um, but eventually to really see a, to really see this uranium bull market really take off. I really don't think the show's really started. Um, we're kind of in the, uh, I don't want to you know, tell you know, say like, oh, we're only in the sec second inning, second inning or third inning. Um, but these things, you know, when they take off, they really explode. Um, you know, it just happens all slowly then all at once. Um, can you, and can I don't you go think back to the, uh, to just the uranium without the uranium price and gold? Yeah. Um, I was looking at uh 2022 early 2022 where you have that um that uh support line uh, support line mm -hmm. uh it's uh up a little further that that peak at the where it dropped where it retraced right there yep. uh I remember uh even during that time you know when um uh Rick uh Rick would talk about uh some of these stocks were getting ahead of themselves yep. and so and then you know we had the the retrace. I mean, we obviously had a, another spike, and then um, this was after the uh, Russia Ukraine situation. But now it's like now we're seeing you know more uh, bullish factors come in. You know, with um, you know the governments around the world and their policies, and and wanting to um, secure nuclear energy, and you know countries are seeing it as a um, as risk to their to their military. And uh, the defense of their nations, um, you know, many things of that nature. And then you have the clean energy transition. I mean, the narrative around uranium has changed a lot since then. Um, I mean, uh, there's there's a lot more talk from governmental um, uh, representatives about uranium being a um, a play for how to transition to clean energy. And so it's it just seems like, you know, at first we had a lot of retail investors in who um who drove the price up you know and even you know people like Rick were like hey the price is going up too fast this is not um I mean I think were you in were you in a trade in 21 you know 22 when when the stocks initially started running you know yeah I, I actually um I bought in um April 2020 yep so yeah so you know yeah, it's so I, was, I was there for the entire ride <laughs> yeah yeah so we had the you know the big spike but it wasn't 
the thesis was was still there, but it's like it wasn't um and we weren't seeing like the governments like you know the the United States passing the advance act and and these these different acts and policies that have been passed uh to build nuclear reactors and such like we weren't seeing all of that you know and then we didn't have the Russia Ukraine with the enriched uranium um issue you know and and them exporting i think 40% of enriched uranium you know so like a lot of that stuff didn't even exist back then and so i i think that now this this recent move up is is a true like move because of the the fundamentals are um are becoming more bullish yeah so let me to your point there about retail jumping in and you know spiking the price up and then bringing it back down this is um this is a look at institutional ownership of URA. So URA is the, you know, this is the biggest uranium miners ETF out there, uh, um, you know, uh, even bigger than URNM. Um, so what the green bar here tells us is the volume of, of institutional ownership in URA. The, the black line is the actual URA price. Now, what's interesting, Daryl, where's, where's does, the green? Where's the green line? I'm trying to find the. Oh, is it? I don't, I don't see Hold it on, on your screen. Oh. What about now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. There we go. Okay. So, do you want to cut, cut and go back? No, no, no. We're good. All right. Cool. So, again, so we've got the green bars here. These represent institutional ownership of URA. You've got the black line, which tells us the URA price itself, right? Now, when when did the green bars start going up? When did we start seeing this mass consolid this mass um deluge of institutional ownership come in to the uh to URA? I mean it I, wasn't I, up here, it wasn't at the top. Yeah. Right? Institutional ownership started buying in during the consolidation phase. Mm -hmm. This this spike here in 2021, this was devoid of the amount of institutional ownership that we see today. Yeah. So this tells me that this was a purely retail move up and the consolidation phase was was a purely retail sell off. Mm -hmm. Because look who's buying. And look who's look who owns more URA than ever before at the moment. Yeah. It's it's yeah. it's institutional ownership. So the smart money is coming into uranium. And, you know, like you said, this huge, you know, the, the huge spike and, you know, the crash back down, smart money doesn't engage in this kind of thing. This is all retail money. So I just thought that was interesting to look at, you know, to kind of juxtapose your point there. And that's, that's an important piece to look at. I mean, cause it's showing URA. I mean, cause obviously, you know, we did have uh Sprott come in and Sprott started buying and, you know, there was a lot of hype around that when Sprott got uh uranium participation corp and then, started buying physical pounds. I mean, the Sprott has been, I think they've just been sitting on the sideline for a little while, just accumulating capital. And so, and so yeah. uh, you know, yeah, they're, still, just, they're still, you know, um, they're still, uh, um, what is it? Negative. Um, they're still in negative territory, so they can't buy yet. And mm -hmm. they've been in, yeah, they've been in negative territory for about a year now too. So this huge spike in, so this, this jump in uranium, this was precipitated by, where is it? Here, July of 2021, right? All the way up to here. This was all the Sprott, uh, the Sprott buying zone. So if we actually pull up, um, uh, the actual buying from Sprott over time, you'll notice that here, the, so this chart tells us the total pounds of uranium held by the trust, um, U.U.N. The bulk of their buying was primarily done from July to around around the autumn, the autumn of, or actually, sorry, the spring of twenty twenty two, and so it's this this huge jump. You know this essential doubling in the uranium price. This was all Sput buying, but notice how Sput hasn't bought a lick in the last year. But even despite that, 
look what we have. This yeah. is all purely organic. Mm -hmm. Yep. And, and you know, secondary supply is being wiped off the map. Um, you know, if you look at a chart of secondary supply of uranium on the market, um, that's gonna, you know, that's been cut in half over the last year. So yeah. Yeah, this this is uh this is this makes me even more bullish, man. <laughs> like just even uh I, I mean I, I haven't seen that chart of uh uh institutions buying. And so uh you know you sh I appreciate you sharing that because yeah, I, I didn't even know how much they were buying or what, but that just that speaks a lot. It speaks volumes. Yeah, so here's actually the this is I'm going to pull up a chart from the Cameco um quarterly conference uh this week. All right. So let's do a conference call slides. Here it is. So this was from their Q3 call. And yeah, so you've got primary supply here in blue, secondary supply here in, in gray. And I mean, look at all the uh, secondary supply that's been taken off the market. I mean, going from about 100 to 2023 and that's a little under 50 so half of that pro secondary supply has been decimated mm -hmm. and uh i believe this is when sput came on the market and just ate it all up yeah and uh you know this 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 is pretty much this is essentially looking at the uranium case from a supply uh, from a supply side perspective so you've got your your primary supply um dwindling down your secondary supply also dwindling down um, but your demand is continuing to grow. I mean, we are right here. The delta between supply and demand is still microscopic. Once you start seeing this huge gap start to form, I mean, who knows where the price went? I mean, where the price <laughs> of ura uranium goes? Could be three hundred dollars a, a pound, it's, man. Yeah, it certainly could. I mean, you know, and, and it might be three hundred dollars a pound one day, and it might come back down. You know, the next day or the next week or whatever after a huge run up. But if you look at this chart, I mean, this is a long term thesis. You know, the 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 last uranium uh, bull market, which is which was here from 2003 all the way out until 2008, um, there wasn't the same supply demand dynamic that there is today. There was actual equilibrium in supply and demand dynamic. So what happens when you actually have a huge, when you have these huge gaps forming between the supply and demand? So this chart kind of outlines the historical uranium price. This is something that we, we don't have on, on the likes of trading view. Um, this, this was the first uranium bull market. Um, you know, this is when when nuclear power was first first thing on the scene. Um, you go from I don't even know what that number is. It looks like it's a little under ten dollars to forty dollars. Um, this was a, a result of nuclear demand coming to focus, um, and it was just really, really cheap at the moment. Mm -hmm. And then you had the defense in, inventory drawdown, um, industry consolidation, and lack of investment. Look at how long this bear market was. I mean, imagine being a bag holder all the way up here. 1980 and having to like wait all the way out into 2008 you know to yeah to, to see your uranium mining company you know make a comeback if, if 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 it was even still around at that point um but yeah i mean you know this chart really brings it home because back in oh 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 eight that bull market was number one precipitated by demand, demand growth, China, you know, coming, you know, coming into the market, you know, supply, the supply side really wasn't a big focus today. It's both supply and demand. Yep. Yep. Exactly. It's, it's, it's a pincer move. So, I mean, who knows to just judge this uranium bull market based off of the last great battle we had. Um, I don't think that's the right way to do it. I don't and think anyone, none of us really know where, how high this market's going to go. And that's, and that's not even adjusted for inflation. That's, yep. That's right. Yeah. That's that, right. And you know, when you, when we actually could, when we actually controlled for the money supply, 
Um, you know, to get back to these levels, I mean, that's a five X from, from here today. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So. Yeah, definitely. That's, that's good. That's good. Um, and you know, and just even thinking about just how many reactors are being built and how much fuel is needed for those reactors, uh, you know, there's, there's going to have to be an increase in, in, um, supply. And so, which means more investment, more, uh, favorable policies and all of that. So I, I just think that it's, it's pretty much, a, a sealed deal with, uh, this uranium story. I mean, unless without, without a disaster or something, but you know, it's, but even if, even in that case, like what, what else do you have? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. It's China. It's China. Something going to say, oh, well, you know, forget about these nuclear reactor guys. Forget about it. We're going to scrap these hundred some odd nuclear reactors we're building. Forget about them. We're going to go back to whatever it is we were doing before. No, it's not going to happen. You know, yeah. you might have like a small, you know, a small multi-year panic or sell off. But the long term view of this, you know, is still mm-hmm. it's it's just it's just inevitable. Yeah, um, for sure. Yeah. You know, if So um, let's look at oil. Uh, I think. I think, uh, you know, oil. Yeah. Is, uh, yeah. Oh, just just uh, one more oh, thing yeah. with ahead. uranium. So um, this is URNM. Let me switch over to a candlestick view. So on the URNM side of things, um, you know, we had this clear consolidation pattern here. Four humps broke out of it, clearly. I mean, it doesn't get more, much more textbook than that. And now, you know, we, let me pull up. The daily, more observable, but we essentially hit resistance on the September 2021 high. We hit resistance, failed the test, and now it looks like we're kind of heading back up to that test. What I want to show you is when you measure URNM versus the actual metals price. So this is actually an indication of the health of the market because essentially, for a bull market, you want the miners to begin outperforming the metal because that's indicative of money flowing into, that's indicative of confidence of, of, of capital flow. And what do I mean by that? I mean, when capital starts flowing into more riskier assets, i.e. from, say, the Sprott Physical Uranium Trust to Cameco to NextGen to you know your developers to your explorers, when money starts flowing that way, you know, down the the uh, the, the risk funnel, um, that's telling you that the market has has greater and greater confidence in the sector. So we want to see URNM the miners begin to outperform the metal, and you know we're still very you know we're still very low um, in that valuation. The miners are still fairly cheap compared to the metal, especially when compared to this level that they were um, in November of 2021. November of 2021, you had the miners um, priced higher while the uranium metals price was at like 50 bucks or something along those lines. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, even to get back to those valuations, I mean, we're still 83% off just to get back to those valuations. So I think it's important for your audience to kind of go through the procedure of not only pricing the metal, not only pricing the miners, but also pricing them in conjunction to one another to assess the risk profile of the market and where and how the market's kind of assessing risk. Right now, I mean, we're still, we're, it looks like we're moving back up. You know, we've had a few days of consecutive growth here on the daily candlesticks. We broke out of this um, descending resistance line. And so we'll see what happens next. Um, but, uh, yeah, we still got a long ways ahead for the miners, um, switching over to go ahead. Oh, no, no. I was was just saying, yeah, that's, that's good. Yep. So switching over to oil, um, oil's at 8251. Oil's been acting kind of weird lately. I mean, you'd expect oil to really take off given all of the, uh, geopolitical tensions and, risks in the middle east and talks about oil embargoes and all this stuff but nonetheless oil has been coming down even um, the supply you know the supply like that's you know our inventories are super low and i mean yep. spr has been drained down like 40 percent or something yeah, like yeah it's been that. it's been cut in half too so um the oil market is weird uh, it's really weird right now um but from what i've been 
told from experts in the field, um, they're really looking towards a seventy to ninety dollar range bound price for oil. Um, that's kind of like the the Goldilocks zone that makes the supplier and the buyer happy. Um, but we're at eighty two fifty one. We had a strong day today. Um, as you can tell here with this uh, strong green uh, candlestick, we did have a reverse hammer candlestick yesterday, which indicates possible further downside. Um, so, you know, there, there's that to keep in mind. But I mean, we still closed fairly strong today. We we broke down below this support line um, that we've built since, since mid-summer. Um, and we might go back and retest. And, um, you know, we'll see how that goes. But, you know, oil has been strange lately. And you can see the price of oil here, consolidated, broke out. And, um, you know, this is where we're at now. In terms of the... Uh, I, I also like to look at the um, uh, oil service companies. Mm -hmm. So oil, oil service companies have actually been fairly cheap. Um, you know, despite all of the turbulence in the oil price, I mean, just look at this since 2020, it's just been a steady move up and no one's talking about oil service companies. Mm. Right. I mean, you have your ups and your downs, but I mean, this is a fairly reliable channel. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, and you know, we've had gains, you know, if you compare like the bottom to the, where we're at now, I mean, this is a four and a half X. So. I mean, these companies are all, um, all the bad ones have been kind of washed away over the ten over the last ten years, and so it, it was kind of a Darwinian um, mechanism to where only the 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 best and the most clean uh, in the companies with the cleanest balance sheets survived, and that's what you have today with these oil service companies, and um, you know a, a lot of these companies are like have like PE ratios of like four or three and dividends of like 10 or 20 percent it's insane um but that's kind of where i'm looking at in terms of how to play oil is uh because if you compare oih to the price of oil i mean historically speaking i mean we're still so low on a relative basis compared to the price of oil i mean yeah. There, I mean, that's from an asymmetric point of view. That's really what I, what I liked about commodities at the time when it really got into them, and, and, and still to this day, is that you know these things are very asymmetric. Did and you pull up, um, you pull up uh, Echo Patrol, Echo Echo Patrol EC. I've been noticing. Uh, uh, no, it's uh, without an H, uh, in this petrol like petroleum. Yeah, I've been noticing like some of these, you know, these stocks like, you know, uh, South America oil companies and such. I mean, the dividend yield is just huge. 22 percent. Yeah. P.E. ratio is low, you know, and um, and like many people aren't like American investors aren't really looking at companies like outside of. Like the big names, it seems. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's it's not only I mean, it's not only paying you really good dividends. I mean, it still looks pretty asymmetric, right? Like, looks like there's still a good bit of upside uh, to go. You know, just to get back to those 2011, 2012 highs. But if you're getting paid, you know, twenty, yeah, twenty five percent the whole. <laughs> no, no, that's what I'm saying. I mean, you're, you're, you're making you're making an income, and then you've got as asymmetry at the same time. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Like, what more do you want? Yep, and I mean, obviously, I mean, you got jurisdictional risks. I mean, they're they're based out of Colombia. Um, uh, same thing with Petrobras uh, out of uh, Brazil, uh, but Petrobras pays pays a solid dividend as well. And um, I mean, their their preferred shares, uh, if you look up uh, PBR dot A. Um, they're actually, I think, about fifteen percent or fifty percent owned by government, which is which is pretty interesting. Yeah, um, yeah the government five percent. We got a twenty five percent dividend. Yeah, and so like you know, with this company, I mean, even though like the who who's in um, office at the um, in Brazil, 
now Lula. the president Lula. Uh, the CEO of this company is a part of one of uh, Lula's. Uh, I don't know. I forgot cabinets or something. cabinet members. Yeah, yeah, or something like that. But then the government owns fifty percent of the shares, and so it's like, you know, are they really going to sabotage their? <laughs> I mean, I, I don't know. It's, it yeah. seems unlikely, you know. Yeah, I mean, well, I mean, they could always dilute it, but I, I doubt it too. That's why I mean, you don't go all in on, or you don't put too much money onto to one investment. Mm -hmm. You've, you've got to diversify it out. Um, that's kind of that's what I do as well. I'm not a big risk taker in that regards. I kind of like to identify um, really strong asymmetric plays and just kind of nibble nibble on them on, on a few percentage points mm -hmm. allocations of my portfolio. I mean, you, you put in, you know, something like 5% of your portfolio and something 10 X is, you know, you can afford to lose a few other positions and, you know, that position alone will make up for it. Yeah. And it's, it's, uh, I mean, even with these companies, I, I mean, last year, uh, Petrobras, uh, their dividend was, I think it hit close to 40%. Um, and I mean, with these companies, like you can earn and get your money back, like your initial investment back quick, you know, so, I mean, within, you know, a few years, even, you know, me on an echo patrol and their the last uh, dividend payout, like I earned like multiple shares of the company just from being able to, you know, I, being able to capitalize off that 20%. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's a slam dunk. I mean, I don't know what else what else to say. <laughs> Good job. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty cool. Uh, so um, I wanted uh, – can you see if they – do they got the SPR, SPR chart on there? Yeah, I think they do. I don't remember the, the ticker, though. It should be under economy. I don't know if you type in strategic. Let's see how it... Here it is. <laughs> yeah and, and you, you can you see go. like that's that's when i started in 78 with, with the embargo yeah so it actually peaked in 2011 it's been peaked in 2011 dipped back down held steady up until 2017 and then took a big dump all the way down yeah man that's yeah that's 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 crazy because you know it's, it's supposed to be used to keep us from experiencing the 70s again and and now they have to well it kind of did honestly you know yeah. if they who, who knows how, how how high oil could have gone during the ukraine like the height of the ukraine war and so forth like we were sitting at 125 dollar oil yeah at one point so um but the, but the problem is they can't do it again because i mean they've already what are they going to do gonna, are they going to sell off the remaining half yeah, like they, they have to, and they have to refill it at higher prices too. Yeah, like I'm, cause I'm sure, like the 2000s, you know, uh, I mean, from 2000 to 2000, what five? That was nine eleven, you know, and they filled it then. I mean, yeah. that that was, you know, we were oil was going up then. I, I wonder how that would look, you know, on the oil chart as well. Um, wow, the oil chart is. You can't even see it. <laughs> you can't even see it. Let's, uh, let's, do, let's do this. There it is. So we've got oil down below. We've got the strategic petroleum reserve here. And let's switch this to regular. All right, cool. So, yeah, so they, they were filling it at, you know, what? Anywhere between 20 and $60 a barrel. For $26, America. yep. But but notice how I mean relative to their I mean to back then, they actually bought back in at a suboptimal time. I mean the bottom was all the way down here, mm -hmm. like twenty six dollars, twenty seven dollars. Those are levels not seen back then for ten years. Yeah. So yeah. I mean the government is really known to be good market timers. Yeah, it's, you know, because it's, it's, it's thought. you know they they fill that in. And then, you know, obviously we, we had our relationship with our relationship with Saudi Arabia uh, was more positive than. And now we have like the Saudi Arabia cuts, the Russia cuts, the, the OPEC, you know, drama. And, you know, like we have to refill at a higher price. Yep. Yeah. So yeah, that, that doesn't look too healthy. 
Um, yeah, if we can look at gold. <laughs> yeah, let's pull up gold. All right, so gold is gold is acting weird too. Gold is a a lot of people like to call gold a an inflation hedge. Um, I like to think of it more of a, as a crisis hedge. So yeah. in times of uncertainty, wars, etc., um, that's when people flock to gold. And if you're a believer that the market, you know, sends us signals in terms of what it's anticipating, you know, the market, you know, the the market, you know, the market knows best the, the wisdom of the crowd. Um, it's it's kind of gave us mixed signals. We've had a pretty big run up in gold from a, from the eighteen hundred levels all the way down here in, in October to I mean we broke through two thousand just a couple of days ago, and now gold's kind of consolidating. Doesn't really know if it wants to go up. Doesn't really know if it wants to go down. I mean you have these huge you have these days with these long wicks. So uh, the trade is really confused, and it's trying to price in the risk of the Middle East war, uh, conflict spreading out and becoming more of a regional uh, war. So the market doesn't really know yet. Um, you see, yeah, I mean, just look at these wicks here. And this is all uncertainty coming from the market. So mm -hmm. gold is in, a, in a, is in a weird spot. It did break through from this channel, but it, much like the breakout in oil during the or the breakout in, in oil as well as uranium during the Ukraine war. Um, it, it wasn't a breakout because of, um, you know, uh, you know, uh, standard uh, buyers versus sellers uh, trading behavior, uh, trade uh, trends forming. It was, it was, a, it was, a it was from a cat. The catalyst was an external conflict. There's an externality that caused um, this breakout here. So it's always good to have that extra color when analyzing these charts. Um, because if you just draw like a line here and say, oh, well, you know, you've got your resistance line here. Well, no, not really, because this is this all happened because of an externality. It has nothing to do with the trend, um, with, the, with the price trends, with the, uh, the, the market psychology of the crowd of, of gold buyers and sellers. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, and you look at you look at like, uh, you know, I mean, that's clearly related to Israel attack on Israel, October 2nd, 7th. Yep. And then then you have back in March, the banking crisis. Yep. So it started. So this is, yeah, it literally started on October 6th. So that's this is actually pretty interesting. So the big move started on October 6th, the day a day before the uh, the attack there. So. Yeah, yeah, that's that's weird. That's weird, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Someone, no, <laughs> I don't know. And then, and then you got in March, you got the banking crisis where you had that move up there. Yeah. Um. So you know, it definitely fits the the crisis narrative. You know, I call it insurance for your money, and um, you know, obviously insurance against crisis. Uh, you can probably see uh, if you go back to uh, Russia, Ukraine. What was that February twenty twenty two? Yep, it's right here, somewhere around here. Yep, so February. Around here, yep. That's when it spiked up, made another high. And it seems like it's stuck. It's kind of like it's having trouble breaking this 2100 range. Mm hmm. Yeah, and it's had three crises in the last three years. I mean, uh, you had the, the big drawdown back in 2020 when everything fell. And then it just it just skyrockets uh, to close to twenty one hundred, and then you know comes down, and then then you have the Russia Ukraine, you know. So yeah, it's, it seems like every crisis. I mean, you've had. I mean, this is like what four crises, crises. I mean, you had the pandemic. Yeah, yeah, you, you had COVID. You had Ukraine. Um, I don't know if you crisis. the banking crisis. Um, sure, and then you had. Uh, the Israel uh Gaza war. Yeah, yeah, man. That's I, I asked Peter Grandish on my channel. I said, is this normal? Like, man, I've been in this three years. Is this like supposed to be is this supposed to be like this every time? <laughs> like, why why are why are the people that get it that got in in 2020 experiencing so many crises, you know? <laughs> yeah. So I want to show you something really cool again. 
when you actually control for the money supply, gold is actually fairly cheap. Like, look at where we were. And this is on the lock scale. So if we actually take that out, just for illustrative purposes, I mean, the, the price of gold compared to the M2 money supply would have to 6x just to get back to those 70s highs. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Yeah, for so. sure. Could you overlay some of the, uh, I mean, the, the miners have been getting killed, like Newmont and all of them. And I wonder how they yeah. relate to the gold chart because they, they are not really, res I mean, they respond temporarily, but they're not like. Yeah. So this is GDX on its own. And, you know, they've just been following this. Getting clobbered, man. This law, I mean, this is like a decade long resistance line that they've been struggling to break your GDX. And then if you look at GDX compared to the gold price, I mean, they are so cheap. It's, it's ridiculous. Like it, it, it's literally. Man, yeah, 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 yeah. That's that's yeah. The, these right miners, at it's right at support. I mean, essentially, yeah. These miners are very cheap. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I, I saw Frank on Nevada take a take a huge dive, but um, that was related yeah. to some some geopolitical risk or some uh, political risk where they're at. Yeah, I mean, but this is where, um, you know, if you've got the patience and, um, you know, patience is, a, is an edge. Yeah, yeah, the heart and the courage and the courage. Yep. Um, you know, this is where people like Rick Roll bought Paladin at like, what, two cents or a cent or something back in mm -hmm. the year 2000. Um, you just got to be willing to, to take the plunge. But, um, you know, <laughs> this is yeah. where it is. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. Definitely. Well, man, uh, Brent, appreciate you going through the charts and everything. Um, uh, definitely want to give you opportunity to share, you know, just about your channel and and some things that that you're working on. Yeah, so uh, my YouTube channel is Capital Cosm. Um, I also have a, a Twitter handle or X handle, if you want to call it now. It's also at Capital Cosm. Um, you know, I post try to post videos weekly. Yeah, you know, do solo analysis like this with commentary. Um, and, uh, you know, have guests on the channel, just, you know, kind of like what, what you do as well. I've, ha I've had Rick Roll, Doomberg, Justin Hewn, um, you know, the, as, as well as people that, you know, uh, may not be familiar, uh, the, the familiar faces like, uh, Simon Michaud. I mean, he was, you should have him on your, on your channel if you haven't already. Um, he really dives into the, um, the outlook for, um, the energy transition and um, just the um, just how just how bad the crisis really is. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, that can, that from from an investment point of view, you know, you can you can kind of capitalize off of it. But it was just very interesting to know to kind of figure out like how how far in the hole we were. But um, but yeah, you can find me at Capital Cosm on my YouTube channel, Capital Cosm on Twitter. And, uh, you know, thanks for having me on the show, Daryl. It was, it was a pleasure. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Let's do it again sometime. You know, as, as uh, these developments keep happening, these crises uh, keep occurring. So, uh, yeah, yeah that's, that's you, 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 <laughs> you think it's going to intensify or just cool off? You think that's it? You think we've hit peak crisis no, we, and things going to cool down? And you know, the fourth, the fourth turning is here. Yeah, <laughs> and that's, that's a, I just I just think that the fourth turning is here. You know, it's it's uh it's going to be interesting to see how the rest of this plays out this decade. You know. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, kind of like what we started off the podcast with, um, you know, crises and wars are inflationary. And um, how do you play inflation it's through commodities? And uh, that's what we're doing. Exactly. Exactly. Well, all righty, man. Appreciate you coming on and everything. Let's stay in touch. And uh, everyone, be sure to go check out uh, Danny's channel, Capital Cosm. I will link to it uh, in the description and, uh, and also uh, follow on Twitter. Awesome. Bye, guys.